silent. We will not obey. We will not allow our government to destroy our humanity. We are the final American Revolution. extremely happy to be joined by someone I hold in very high regard, a person who I've followed for a long time and someone who I've learned a lot from. So today I have the great, great pleasure to be joined by Adam Kokesh. Um, hello Adam, how are you today? Outstanding Rob, it's a beautiful day here at the Garden of Freedom in the mountains of northern Arizona and I love it every day, every day I wake up. I have these, I know this is a weird way to start this interview. Uh, but I, my, my wife and I, we have a morning gratitude and love exercise that we do just three things and <laughs> that's, you know, and whatever conversation comes of that, mm -hmm. but also it's a great, it's a great way to start the day. I, I mean, I, I think everybody, it, it's, it's a weird habit to maintain. I've been on and off with it, but I've always felt better when I had, you know, when I kept it up, like working out and it's like working out, retraining your brain to positivity and gratitude and love. And one of the things here at the, at the garden that I, I wake up to every day, I can look outside my window and see uh, one of our many survivor trees. And, and if you want, Rob, at, at the end of this, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll pick up my camera and we'll go outside and I'll show you uh, some of my favorite survivor trees and a, and a quick visual tour of what we have going on here at the Garden of Freedom Homestead. Excellent. Very good. Very good. Well, I mean... I, I, I've often said it in my um, vlogs that, you know, even for myself, like I'm lucky enough, I live beside a small woodland and, you know, just, just having a walk um, along the wood and it's, 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 it's really great for the body and the mind, you know, and, and it, you can't help but be positive after a refreshing uh, walk in nature, you know, and um, so I can understand, totally understand how you must feel. Yeah, I got, I got, yeah. I have, I have just my little slice of enough of that, even within my fence. I have 10 acres, wow, and I like to describe <laughs> what we have here as, and then there's plenty of places around, and we're surrounded by trees and, you know, mostly open range, and you can stand in the middle of the property, and you can't see the edges because I have, I have so many. And it's not like I have a lot of trees. They're beautiful. They're amazing trees, the junipers here. Um, but yeah, and we got two subspecies, primarily Rocky Mountain and Utah junipers. We'll mm -hmm. save it for that. That's a good tease for the end of the interview. <laughs> so, yeah, so have you been hugging trees for the last hour? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I don't know. I'm, I, I'm, uh, I mean, I'm still a pretty, you know, hard-nosed objectivist. 
You know, you talk about hugging trees. Like I love, the, I love the metaphor of it. You know, <laughs> am, am I a, a tree hugging hippie of a libertarian because you know I, I bring that philosophy and property rights and voluntarism concepts to environmentalism issues and property rights and lifestyle and use of natural resources. And I love trees. I don't hug them. I don't think, I mean, I, I get it. Like if you want to connect with nature and there's like a thing, okay, you hug a tree. It's, it's, an, it's not for the tree's benefit. You know, it's for yourself. Right. Mm -hmm. And if, uh, I, I don't need that. I love my trees. Uh, but we, we keep it, you know, consensual, mostly no touching <laughs> relationships. Okay. Just watering. So Adam, I, I'd like to give a de decent intro to my guests in case there's some people who are maybe not as clued into who who you are and what you do, um, and perhaps this side of the world anyway. Um, so just quickly, um, Adam is, I'll try and go through this fast. I, I do all of this over prepare, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so just quickly, Adam is an American libertarian, a political activist, has a very popular YouTube channel called Adam vs. The Man and is author of the book Freedom. Uh, Adam served as uh, served in Iraq as a US Marine. Um, on Pawnee's return from Iraq, he became an anti-war activist and an advocate for Iraq veterans against the war. And since then, you've also been involved in many libertarian and human rights issues. Um, now, it's funny that you you said the, you, you, you've the right positive frame because I was just about to say one thing I love from Adam is his positivity. Um, I don't think I've ever looked at one of your videos and not seen you without a smile or some positive vibes which you can get from the video, which is brilliant. And exactly what we need in 2020, the year of fair porn and constant doom and gloom. So as I said, Adam, thanks for joining me today. Thank you. Hey, I, you know, someone else wrote that. I would never have used the word served. You know that, right? When someone says thank you for your service, I always take that as an opportunity to proselytize or at least make a quick point because, okay. you know, we were serving bankers, politicians, and war profiteers. Yes. Yes. And, and, and I, I usually, I usually, you know, I, and, and I, I still respect the noble intention behind joining the military for most people. You know, you hear the joke, well, I joined the Marine Corps to get my teeth fixed. Now, you know, like the majority of people who join the military do so for the right reasons and do so for very noble reasons and with a great spirit of sacrifice and service. Mm -hmm. And that's what's so sad. I mean, this is a measure of the great tragedy of militarism. Aside from the body counts, if that wasn't enough, aside from the measurable ripoff of the drain on the economy that the military industrial complex is and what that represents is a, a lowering of the quality of life for everyone in the world. But I take it a little more personally with militarism in that, well, there's a difference between warriors and soldiers. There's overlap, you can be both, but a warrior, well, you really can't by my definition. So bear with me. Uh, a warrior, you know, it, by the way, n n sidebar upon sidebar upon sidebar, uh, you know, Rob, you're an activist with what you're doing with independent media. You're an activist and an, and an activist is motivated by a deep seated sense of injustice. You see something in the world that bothers you and you have to respond to that little nagging voice in the back of your head that says, I cannot abide this injustice. You know, Martin Luther King Jr., uh, uh, an injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And uh, as an activist, I think you're also a warrior. And I, I think we have, you know, you, warrior doesn't mean by physical force, you know, but it does mean taking risks to some degree, right? When you're standing up to injustice, you're willing to put your life on the line to protect those who can't protect themselves, to defend a righteous cause. A soldier, by contrast, is someone who is willing to kill for politicians. And that's the difference between militarism. That, that's a representation of the perversion of militarism on society. And even the founders were against the idea of a standing army. They wanted a decentralized militia-based defense. And it, it, it's definitely 
you know, a relevant subset to the ideas or, you know, part of the, the ideals and ideas and principles of libertarianism. But it is one, and, and I think this is something I get from Ron Paul, you know, this is money and banking fueling wars with fiat currency, of wars of aggression that don't meet Christian just war standards by a mile, that result in the death of countless innocent people. And separating this cancer of militarism from the warrior class is one of the things that I'm most passionate about. Okay, good. Um, so did you think like this when you joined up and was uh, shipped No, of course Iraq? not. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, no and, and despite that, I had, I had absolutely pure intentions. Oh, I can't say, uh, you know what, that's not true. Um, I had mostly pure intentions. Uh, I had some uh, delusions of grandeur as a soldier, you know, being a, a Marine, uh, that I'm, I'm going to be a badass, I'm going to be the tough guy, uh, politicians are going to blow smoke up my butt, and women are going to offer to suck me off at bars when you know, they find out that I'm a combat veteran. You know, like, yeah, there's a little bit of that in it for me. Um, and I, I think that's actually a very relevant point, that that's a big way that the warrior class is perverted to become soldiers is the money and the scheme and the pretty uniforms and making women swoon and yeah. all that sort of stuff. Um, but uh, joining the military, even with those honorable intentions, is recklessly naive, irresponsible. To not do your due diligence and say, oh, yeah, I'm going to sign up. I'm going to be a part of this. And, and like, they, they've conditioned us to a bigger worldview that leads us to not question authority as much as we should. And to analyze things from a very narrow personal cost-benefit perspective. You know, when I joined the Marines, I, I, I was looking at, well, what about this contract and this? And do I go here? Is this my MOS or is that? Not, what is the impact on the world? And will I ever be asked to do something? Unethical. Am I? Am I be? Am I signing up to to follow? Or, you know that to, to put myself in a situation where I'm going to go to jail for disobeying illegal orders uh, if I decide that uh, those illegal orders need to be defied, not just because they're illegal, but that you know you're, you might be killing innocent people, like the My Lai massacre in Vietnam, right? Mm -hmm. um, and in my case, it was torturing people. And you know, I, I don't. When I say it like that, it kind of oversimplifies and, and, and dramatizes it a little bit more than it deserves to be. But uh, I, I was in civil affairs in Fallujah in 2004, and one night during the siege of Fallujah uh, in uh, in April. Man, I'm I'm an old crusty veteran at this point. Geez, I'm talking about something that happened 16 freaking years ago now. Yeah. Anyway. Um, so I, I was just asked to guard a couple of detainees little, uh, you know, in, uh, in a guard shack next to the uh, Brooklyn Bridge, which was the northern bridge over the Euphrates River next to Fallujah, where the Blackwater security contractors were strung up and burned on international TV uh, in February, leading to uh, the siege and, and the first in, the Battle of Fallujah that I was there for. And the second Battle of Fallujah, you know, again, my, I, I don't want to overplay this. And this isn't just like typical veterans you know, humility. I got a slice of combat. You know, I never fired my weapon. I got shot at. I was a driver, so you're not shooting if you're driving. Um, you know, a lot of indirect fire, but, you know, it was enough. And what was even more formative to me than the trauma of combat was this particular experience of knowing that I did something illegal and unethical, obviously the illegal is a distant secondary consideration here, but that I did something fundamentally unethical. And I think, I think signing up in the first place, well, maybe not an immediate violation of the non-aggression principle, you know, you're not violating, you know, you don't have a victim in the crime when you, you know, sign up for the military, but you are empowering, you are an accessory to the crime of the existence of the military industrial complex today. And that night in Fallujah, I was asked to guard detainees who had sandbags over their heads and their hands zip tied behind their backs and they were forced to sit cross-legged on a hard cement floor. Mm. And by itself, it, it's not a stress position. Mm. Give it half an hour. 
<laughs> then it's a stress position. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, when you're not allowed to get up to go to the bathroom or you not often fall asleep and you've got me right there using the Arabic that I learned at, with good intentions to be better at my job in civil affairs. That was my MOS. I deployed with the civil affairs team. Taunting them to keep them awake. It was a sleep deprivation, stress position, torture mm -hmm. to soften them up for interrogation. So, yeah, uh, I, I crossed the line in a, in a really disgusting way. And I mean, these inmates, uh, inmates, these, these detainees were, uh, you know, in already sitting in their own excrement by the time I, I got to them, you know, um, being in that mindset of, of following orders without question uh, is, is an extremely dangerous state that I, I, I think no human should ever enter. Yeah, well, thanks, thanks for sharing that, Adam. Um, that was um, fascinating. Um, I, I guess then it, 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 can, it must make you kind of, like knowing your politics now, it must make you feel kind of dirty like I don't mean that in, in a negative way, but like that that you you went through that, and it's it's a kind of a um, it, there's also abuse of the soldier as well that he's been degraded enough to do these kinds of acts. Hold on a second, right there, Rob. You know, you just inspired a, a new idea in me that <laughs> it, it, it's it's I think you know uh, there are no new ideas under the sun. I know, uh, but it's a, it's a a certainly an important development of some ideas for me and my show on. Thursday, I do Adam versus the man as, as a live show, Monday, Friday, 9 to 11 a.m. Pacific. It's a lot of fun, a lot of audience interaction. The title of the show on Thursday was The Good News. And it was inspired by a lot of things. But, you know, I, I've, as I've been covering the coronaphobia crisis, and, and let's, let's be real, you know, we're talking about a virus that has a lower fatality rate than testifying against Hillary Clinton. Well, I'm sorry. Every, every time I mention her name, I have to say I am not now, nor have I ever been suicidal. Uh, okay, so it's a virus less deadly than trying to spend a counterfeit $20 bill in Minneapolis. How about that? So if uh, the good news you know, I, I was I was using that as a deliberate reference to Christianity. Have you heard the good news? You know, in Christianity, the good news is, you know, it, right. And I'm excuse me for the Christians watching. If I get this wrong, I'm I'm a, a, a Buddhist pantheist Wiccan. Um, but, uh, you know, the good news is that, that, that Jesus is here as your savior. He died for your sins and God loves you. This is the good news. Right. And in I you know, I. Uh, freedom as an ethical foundation, I don't want to call it a religion, but it displaces a lot of the traditional functions of organized religion. And one of the ways that it does that is by giving you this more positive long-term goal. Uh, it gives you hope for a better future. And, you know, in Christianity and, and a lot of bigger traditional organized religions, that's an afterlife or God's will on earth fully realized, or you know, some other you know, future vision, the end times. You know, if you read the end of the Bible, it's, I think the person who wrote it was on acid. And if the, you, you asked me about you know, this experience with torture in Iraq with the contrast to my views now and, and how it propelled me to that, and, and the, the words you used were, does it make you feel dirty, right? Something like that. I'm like, you know, dirty... And the first thing that occurred to me was that that caused like an explosion in my brain of, <laughs> of, of beautiful thoughts. And, you know, when, when you said that, the first thing I, I thought was none of us is without sin. You know, as libertarians, we prescribe a very specific, very clear, somewhat absolutist, although certainly adaptable with lots of ways of, of, of making it apply to whatever situation you find yourself in, but it is a, a pretty strict moral code of the non-aggression principle and it's self-ownership. You own yourself. And that's what makes it wrong to violate someone else's self-ownership. 
to use aggression against them, to commit uh, an act of force or, or uh, violence or, or fraud, if you're, if you're using deception to deprive someone of their property or their freedom or their well-being, same thing. Uh, if you're uh, killing them and taking their life and their, their whole future of freedom, uh, these are pretty absolute moral standards. And with libertarianism, you know, we prescribe the eventuality of a completely voluntary society, a world of peace and harmony and nonviolence where all human relationships are free of force, fraud, and coercion, and everybody respects the non-aggression principle. Now, accidents happen. You can violate the non-aggression principle by accident without conscientious ill intent, without trying to deliberately harm someone and get away with it. You know, you damage someone's property, you, you get into a car accident, uh, you get drunk and you, you bump into someone and you cause some minor injury, or you get angry and you punch somebody in the face, you know, and I used to joke, well, you, yeah, we're going towards a voluntary society, but as soon as someone gets drunk and punches somebody else in the face, for the guy getting punched, it's not very voluntary. And I see this as inevitable, by the way, you know, zooming out again, the bigger picture. This is part of what to me is the good news of freedom is that violence is on the decline over human history. This isn't my assessment. This is Steven Pinker, Harvard professor, who did a great TED talk called The Surprising Decline in Violence. Highly recommend that if you haven't seen it uh, to reaffirm this in your worldview that humanity progresses. You know, it might be two steps forward, one step back, but humanity marches on. The great dance of our species, of the great global human family, continues. And in the way that Christianity offers salvation, so does libertarian ethics. All you have to do is take responsibility mm -hmm. for how you have hurt other people. And for a lot of us, there were specific things like I was in the military, I volunteered for combat, I tortured in people and I helped kill people. Mm. And, you know, I think my my appropriate recompense for that. Um, and long term, I'd like to I'd like to, uh, you know, be you know, maybe maybe if we get our crap together here in the U.S., you know, it's worth pointing out that if America saw what America was doing to America right now, America would invade America to save America from the current regime of American dictators in America. Like, you know, holy crap, yeah. But yeah, I'd like to, to organize, and, and this was a big part of my activism with Iraq Veterans Against the War, talking about reparations for the Iraqi people. And this is, you know, I don't know, if, I keep sidebarring here. I could talk about libertarian reparations <laughs> and all that. But that was a really cool idea is that we can embrace ethics and take responsibility for your actions. Mm -hmm. You can absolve yourself of guilt and shame. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's a big thing that Christianity and, and religions offer people in a way that right now they, they kind of fell short. And whether you say that's a part of religion should be or shouldn't, uh, the, the, this function of libertarianism that is, is similar to all these religious dynamics uh, really, really should be appreciated and valued either as a, a replacement or a supplement or, you know, however people want to use it. Mm. Okay. Maybe. Yeah. Well. Yeah. I mean, that's that's quite a good um, answer. I mean, when I said uh, dirty, I meant like I would see that you you were abused by the system as well, and like looking reflected on it, you you would feel that you were used by the system. But then you did say volunteer, you volunteered as well, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and you did you, you probably should have um, yeah known more about, it, but. You know, um, yeah, and, but and it's, it's a, it's a mentality is dangerous. I, I want to do everything I can. Uh, you know, you can recognize how you are a victim without embracing that victim mentality. Mm -hmm. And a, a big part of, uh, of my book, Freedom, mm -hmm. is about emotional. And this is free in every digital format possible at thefreedomline.com. Rob, I'm sure you're going to get that in the links. But there's a section here called emotional freedom. And as an animal, you're going to have negative emotional responses to stimuli. It's going to happen. You're going to stub your toe. You're going to be pissed off. You know, someone is going to say something mean. You're going to be angry, right? That's fine. I'm not prescribing here that, that we all strive to be like, Zen Buddhist monks all the time walking around living 
you know, healthy, vibrant, engaged lives. What I'm suggesting is that while you cannot completely control the response, you almost completely can control the response to the response. Something makes you angry as a stimulus. It's your choice whether you stay angry as soon as you can remind yourself that you have that freedom, that ultimate sovereignty over your own mind. And one of the big ways that our current statist government power structure takes advantage of us is by denying us that freedom, or at least tricking us into giving it up, really, because it's always yours. And a big, like, I, I started writing this book when I was in jail, and that was a big part of the inspiration, is that I was in jail, but I was there for a good, good cause. And, you know, I was, I was healthy, you know, and there's some caveats to this. This is like, you know, if you don't have chemical problems, you know, if, if you don't have, uh, you know, if you're, if you're generally healthy and, and sane and present, you know, reclaiming emotional freedom and choosing happiness is one of the most important things you can do to, to learn from this message. Yeah. Well, to apply it. Yeah, well, I agree. I mean, it, that's why I love uh, libertarianism because it, it has so much potential um, for humanity if only m more people didn't see it. But and it is a positive, uh, you know, belief. Um, I, I was, I, I, I'm actually a Christian myself, but um, I can understand what you're saying. I mean, it, it, there is similarities, really. And um, for me, it's inter it, there's no like the way I would live as a Christian would be the same as the way I'd live as a libertarian, you know? Um, yeah. No, they're not, they're not contradictory at all mm -hmm. in, in the ethics and application. And I would say in, in, in that sense, you know, we, Christianity addresses spiritual salvation. And I'm not familiar with all of the different denominations and, and their methodology, but just using Catholicism as one example with, with its you know, very specific form of confession, right? Mm -hmm. So you are saved by faith, you mm -hmm. know? Well, that's, that's great. You know, some, you know, there's a, the, the debate in Christianity, are you saved by faith or saved by work, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, is, is it, is it just, can, can you have a completely sinful life at the, and at the very end of it say, I embrace, I, I, I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior and still go to heaven? Or do you have to live it? Does your tally have to kind of add up at the end of your life? And I, I don't want to weigh in on that, but on the tally side, if you Christianity doesn't really answer the question of how do you make your victims whole? You know, if it, it, the difference between punishment and justice is really critical. If you want justice, you know, if, if you wrong somebody, how do you actually make it right? Mm -hmm. And and uh, the libertarian ethical framework based on self-ownership and property rights, I think in that sense is is the great practical supplement to Christian ethics. I don't know. I correct me if I'm wrong. You know, <laughs> if any if any other Christians in the audience like, no, your your epistemi, epistemology is is off bad. Oh, all right, I, I can see it. I'm not I, I think my bigger points stand. Even okay. if I'm off on some aspect of my understanding of Christianity here. Okay, I would just uh, go back to uh, Fallujah. I mean, the battle for Fallujah is, is famous or infamous. I mean, it was a pretty hardcore destruction of a of a town or a city. I mean, it, so it, like, were there chemical weapons used? I guess there was. I mean, we... oh yes, absolutely. Now we don't think of them as chemical weapons because their chemical effects are secondary to their ballistic effects or incendiary effects. And the two chemical weapons that were used in the Battle of Fallujah were depleted uranium and white phosphorus. Mm -hmm. Now depleted uranium is definitely not used in any way as a chemical weapon. It's just extremely toxic and ends up having worse effects when you look at the chill. I mean, you wanna know the real tragedy of Fallujah, it's the children who were born after the battle. Mm -hmm. And depleted uranium is, you know, as the name suggests, uranium that has been depleted of its radioactive elements. So you get an extremely dense, heavy metal. So the U.S. military uses this in munitions and in armor. And so not only is it a problem when you're blowing stuff up with it or shooting, you know, 50 caliber rounds into a city with it and they're, you know, splattering or, or, or giving off, uh, you know, a, a toxic waste. 
but in some of the vehicles that had depleted uranium armor, U.S. troops were poisoned when those were hit with Iraqi munitions. So it, it's just, there's no reason to use it. It's, uh, you know, just another disgusting quirk of the military industrial complex. The other one, white phosphorus, uh, I'm more familiar with from my time in the artillery, which I was in the reserves with before I volunteered to deploy with civil affairs. And white phosphorus is an incendiary smoke munition. Man, I mean, this is taking me back to like before 2004, my actual artillery train, which was at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, which we used to joke was the a-hole of America. Back then, uh, Marines did their M1908 uh, artillery training. Now, if, you, if you want to look up, you know, what it was, the M1908 howitzer is a 155 millimeter cannon that shoots uh, 100 round explosives as its primary round, 155 millimeters. You know, it's, it's a big round, and that 100 pound standard high explosive uh, round is a uh, hits with a kill radius of 50 meters or 50 yards and a uh, casualty radius of 100 yards. So, like, if you're within 50 yards of it, you're dead. If you're within 100 yards, you're probably out of commission. And uh, the white phosphorus as I recall, uh, w was used for, for incendiary and screening purposes. And again, you know, when you talk about an overwhelming military force going in to cordon off a city, and the reason it happened the way that it did, we had the invasion and then the occupation, and then the battle like that, you know, the invasion was 2003, March 19, 2003. And I got there February 2004, almost a year later. and the Ba'ath Party had been chased out of most of the Sunni Triangle, and that was Baghdad and Tikrit, I think, to the north. And the remainder of the Ba'ath Party holdouts were the basis for that, you know, insurgency in Fallujah, the city of mosques. So, um, the other thing that I, I really learned from this that, that kind of makes it personal the first battle of Fallujah in, in, um, in I guess it was March, yeah, of, of 2000, 2004. Um, no, sorry, April. It was April. I've been there. I got there February. The first battle was April. I left in September right before the second battle, which was, if you recall, in November. Right after, what else happens in November? Mm -hmm. Presidential election. <laughs> 2004, right? And by our on-the-ground strategic tact, or as uh, you know, Bush would have called it, strategery. By the on-the-ground strategery of Fallujah, like we knew. So there was this weird negotiation at the end of the first battle, where we handed authority over to Iraqi Civil Defense Corps and Iraqi police, and they had authority in the city, and it was it was horrific. Uh, but the, it, it was, it was really very, uh, it was a very corrupt deal. Uh, there's so much more I could get into on this, but we knew that we were going to have to sweep through the city eventually. Now, I don't say that as an absolute truth. We could have left, <laughs> you know, we could have, we could have pulled out. We could have like you know, declare victory and pull out that, you know, but, um, the, reality was that that political corrupt conclusion to that phase of the Battle of Fallujah was for political purposes. Mm. You know, a handful of Marines had died. And if we had swept through the city, that would have been, you know, midsummer. It would have taken a while to plan and stage the operation properly and go through and you know, methodologically clear a city. And the headlines would have been, <clears throat> now 20, 30 Marines dead in downtown Fallujah, maybe 40. But it was pushed back to not happen before the election so that Bush could win uh, mm -hmm. re-election. And as a result, not only did one or two Marines die every day, maintaining that weird standoff semi-siege status 
in the city. But the number of Marines who died in the main battle of Fallujah, the second battle, was way higher because the insurgents had time to fortify the city, to build death traps mm -hmm. and stockpile weapons. You know, the famous death house, the photo with the you know Marine first sergeant with, you know, he's all bloody. And he's got, you know, one arm over one Marine, another with his, with his K-bar in one hand and his, his, his service pistol in the other. And, you know, a lot, so a lot of people died. Mm -hmm. A lot of Marines died. And it's, it's really important to keep in mind the restraint of Muslims. You know, I, I, I thought I, this occurred to me recently, actually thinking about Black Lives Matter and all the, the George Floyd riots slash protests when, um, you know, there, there's this relief. I think that we should feel as white Americans. Now I'm half Jewish and half German. So I don't know if I'm like the most loved or the most hated ethnic group or like the most <laughs> victimized or, or if they're both just hated, you know, um, I don't know which half of me should be oppressing the other half. It's, it's very confusing for practical purposes. I'm white. Okay. Like, yeah, I look white. I just have a funny Jewish nose. You know, you, know, you can tell I'm part of that tribe, but, uh, you know, at least a, there's a little bit of that, but, uh, yeah, I get it. You know, I'm, you know, I came from, uh, you know, upper middle class background, all the advantages of, you know, mainstream America. And when you, you hear some of this pushback against Black Lives Matter from white America, it's like, you should be glad they're asking for equality and reparations as opposed to revenge. Like, do you realize, like, yeah, the, 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 the evil that we're talking about here is of such an obscenely greater scale that, that, that any of the buildings burned in protest, you can write off as insignificant in the bigger picture, like compared to all of the, the black Americans who died in slavery, right? Mm -hmm. Now, insignificant. And if you look at 9-11, Hold on, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll wrap this up in this last connection. 9-11, 3,000 dead Americans, allegedly, right, all that. Uh, if you look at all of the terrorism committed by Arabs and Muslims throughout all of human history, compared to the death count of the evil that Western civilization has visited upon the Arab world, we should be grateful for the restraint of Muslims. Irish person. I mean, you could not say that Irish people had white privilege, you know, especially with the history. Oh, that no, we've had. I'm not, yeah, of course not. Did, did no. I did I phrase something in a way to suggest the, a denial of that? No, no. But I'm just saying that that's I see that is even in Switzerland that the media are shaming people because like um, if you're if you're not bowing down and bend the knee. Black oh, yeah. Act. No, I'm not. Yeah. No, no. You, yeah, that is. Yeah. And, and this is another important thing that we learn from libertarian ethics and separating real responsibility from, you know, victimless crimes and, you know, who's who's really at fault. And a, a big part of it is not collectivizing people. So when I when I say like, you know, you know, it's, it's more like let's break out of this mentality of identifying by race at all as a, as a way of, that, that has relevance in, in how we see our role in the world. Trying to hold all white people accountable or saying that all black people have been victims is a, an intellectual fallacy, a logical fallacy uh, of a collectivization. Yeah, well, um, yeah, well, I agree. I mean, I, I, I mean, I think America is slightly different because you, you are in, um, a nation that has such a diverse culture and, and, and built on immigrants and everything. So you don't really have the roots and the history. Um, but I think like, um, like for someone like from Ireland, I, I've never thought of myself as white. You know, I've never felt that I, I was, I don't know, I've never felt I'm white. It's just always been Irish. And I feel that's like a tribal thing. To me, being Irish is a tribal thing. So, you know, I, I just think 
all lives matter, you know? <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, well, is, is tribalism a good thing? You know, it's, I, I, it, I, I think there's definitely, I mean, there are definitely good and bad aspects of it, but largely it doesn't serve us. Yeah, but I, and it, 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 I see it as a spiritual thing. My national, it's not the waving of the flag. It's not the, the music, the national anthem. It's not, you know, I find that kind of patriotism is very cheap. Mine is more the land, rooted in the land, rooted in the culture, rooted yes. in the, the music. Yes, 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 you know? yes. A personal, a, a personal connection with heritage and culture and history. I, I'm all for it. And for me, it's the same thing. Like I said. You know, kind of joking. Like, I get it. I'm practically white for all intents and purposes. But I don't think of myself as white. I'm half Jewish and half German. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. So, I mean, I, I might... I, I understand what you're trying to say. But I, I'm, I just think that it the issue with the Black Lives Matter thing is it's been used by white liberals to give themselves a pat on the back. Look at me, I'm Oh, I'm for great. sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so it, it, there are a lot of problems with the Black Lives Matter movement as a whole, even judging it as a movement, not trying to, you know, slander the movement based on an individual's actions. The premise of it, however, and I've been saying this since the beginning, and when, when someone says, hey, Black Lives Matter, what they're saying is, hey, the system operates in a way in which black lives don't matter as much as non-black lives, and mm -hmm. we need to address it. And if you come out and say, all lives matter, it's like, yeah, okay, <laughs> but I was calling attention to this problem. It is a real distinct problem. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, I support the core message and the intent of most people who engage in the Black Lives Matter movement. Of course, there's political manipulation. Man, I've been saying this since the beginning with George Floyd. Why is this happening now? It's all controlled opposition. It's all manipulated, manufactured crises. I think that there, there are two bigger narratives on this, is that the coronaphobia crisis was not a singular global conspiracy. If it was, we'd have more uniform, coordinated responses. It's more of a feeding frenzy of fear. A lot of little conspiracies working together to stoke the fear, to take advantage of people. And I would wager, although there might be bigger examples in China, that the United States government adding $9 trillion of liquidity to the market, if that's all it is, it's probably more now, you know, using this as the excuse represents, if not the biggest, one of the biggest ripoffs in human history. And it was based on lies. And, and just to be clear about the virus, it's real. I'm not a, I'm not a virus denier, uh, but, but what is it? It's a funky off-season flu, right? <laughs> you know, we can, ha we can handle it without adding a forced unemployment crisis on top of it. You know, there's a reasonable way that we can go about this, again, in accordance with libertarian ethics, respect for individual rights to set their own levels of risk. We wouldn't be in this crisis that we're in right now. And so they want to cover it up. Right now, everybody in America is talking about Black Lives Matter and police brutality. Not, hey, where'd that money go? Because it mm. got sucked out of our back pockets and our bank accounts. That's how fiat currency works. When they create money out of thin air through fractional reserve banking or through the overnight lending window with the Federal Reserve System, it, it increases the money in the system, the monetary supply. The supply is inflated. And that's how the purchasing power of your dollar goes down because now there are more dollars chasing the same amount of goods and services in the market. And this ripple, like we would, that's the conversation we would be having right now. All of these rackets that libertarianism addresses, one way or another, I mean, I'm trying to think if there are any exceptions. I, I really don't think there are, other than maybe arrogant cops getting some psychological gratification, you know, beating up kids. But or, or black people, or, who, or white people, or poor, poor people. Certainly not rich people. Cops don't beat up rich people, right? All of this is designed so the rich get richer and the poor get poor. So they cover it up. They, they, it's a huge distraction. It, the thing about George Floyd, yes, it was a particularly disturbing video that genuinely went viral. But that happens a lot in America, actually. Mm -hmm. 
And there are more brutal videos out there than that. There is a unique effect. I, I mean, I thought the Eric Garner, you know, the first I Can't Breathe with Officer uh, on his neck, right on his neck with his face right there, choking him to death. You know, uh, why is this happening now? As you point out, the liberals, although I would say more specifically the Democrats and the establishment media manipulating the conversation. If they didn't want it to happen, it wouldn't happen. Of course, there's a lot of financial and political manipulation. This happens every four years. Surprise, surprise. That's what they call the, the October surprise or, you know, the pattern of long, hot summers in America. Well, you know, we were we were set up for this. There was a lot of, you know, manipulation. And in that sense, it seems like the Democrats with the liberal media helping them out set a trap for Trump. And I'm not saying this to defend Trump. He's a he's a socialist, totalitarian fascist, just like all the Democrats. Uh, you know, the, the, we're talking about the Republican wing of the American Socialist Party or the Democrat wing of the American Socialist Party. They're all for socialism of one kind or another. You know, the, the divisions, the difference between Republicans and Democrats is the difference between going off a cliff at 70 miles an hour or 80 miles an hour. Either way, you're screwed. And I think they set this trap, right? Remember, Trump originally had the right take on the virus. Hey, it's no big deal. We can handle this. Mm -hmm. He actually compared it to the flu, right? And then he declared a national state of emergency. And then when the media attacked him for not doing enough, he put out a campaign ad at one of his press conferences saying, look how much the Trump administration is doing to fight Corona. We're super serious about this. And Trump is probably looking at this like, crap, this is, yeah. Well, at least this is my excuse. I don't have to keep the economy growing through November. I can blame it on Corona. Mm -hmm. And he'll find a way to blame it on Democrat governors and the Democrat Congress and, and say, look, you know, this is, they, I was, I had the right line originally. They manipulated me. And so maybe he'll be able to, to get that message off and pull it out. I doubt it. But the way he looks at it is like he's got one foot in the trap and one foot out. And he's like, ah, oh, I'm going to pull this foot out. But then his other foot slips on a banana peel named George Floyd. Hmm. Yeah. And it's going to lose. I think, I mean, the way things are looking right now, Trump, you know, and I, I, as a libertarian, I've endorsed and I'm, I'm supporting Dr. Joe Jorgensen, the Libertarian Party nominee for president, 100%. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I Hope that she wins and we have a breakout year for the Libertarian Party. Realistically, though, you know, if, if we got 10 percent, that would be amazing. Right. Mm -hmm. And if, if that's all the Libertarian Party is able to do in 2020, Biden is going to beat Trump in a landslide. That's, that's you know, if things could change. We got a few months. That's what it looks like right now. I, I would disagree. I think Trump has it. Because <laughs> I think Biden is just a walking disaster. He's like seen. I <laughs> seen the polls. Biden's yeah, but, up 14 points. Biden, the, and Biden knows. Biden seen, knows all he has to do is nothing. He, it's his to lose. All he has to do is is not pick his nose on camera, and, polls, and he's the president. The polls were badly wrong last time, Adam. But anyway, um, yeah, I understand. Like I, I would have. Yeah, who knows? Yeah, like I'll, I'll give you credit here, Rob. Trump's pretty clever. He's pretty entertaining. He's good at getting people's attention. Does yeah. that mean that he's going to be able to pull it off? Eh, is he playing 4D chess? I doubt it. Maybe <laughs> he's got some tricks up his sleeve. We'll see. It's going to be a fun election to watch either way. Um, I, I would agree with the the, B, the Black Lives Matter and, and the COVID that's been used. Everything does be used. They always use these things. But I would have thought that it, it, the focus should have been on the militarization of the police and you know police brutality that would be my immediate reaction to it but um but it's all it's also quite interesting that people are protesting all over the world like everywhere about this um but they're quite happy to see their everyday liberties go down the pan with the covid pandemic you know i mean it doesn't seem to bother them that you know like for example and even in ireland you might think this is funny uh, in ireland they have a rule that you can't be in a in a pub or a bar for more than ninety minutes. I mean, it's, they're just 
taking stuff out of their arse at this stage. They haven't a clue. And people are lapping it up. They love it. That's, yeah, no, that's, that's what they're doing. Like, it's, you know, why, well, now, like, these, yeah, these, these regulations, you know, I, th- there is, there's a, you know, it, it, it feels like things are getting back to not normal, but the new normal. Mm-hmm. But it's, you know, it's a halting process. It's, uh, you know, there's some back steps in this as well, you know, where, like in Arizona, Doug Ducey, our governor, is considering making masks mandatory in public. Mm. And there's still all of these restrictions at the local level that come and go, where the, the government pretends that they're able to, like, get ahead of the virus with these policies. And, uh, I, yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's wearing thin, but the scary thing is that they've got a new template for a ra- for the government racket uh they've got a new scam right the the modern virus fear-mongering forced unemployment racket because that's what this is this is all designed you know to keep people out of work to suppress the economy especially to keep poor people out of work to create more government dependence and uh, you know all the rich get richer and the poor get poor things about it but now they know Ooh, look who we can get away with we can take an, a funky off season, like what is Corona? Like in terms of, you know, the, the, the great global family's human Petri dish, not that significant. In fact, they, you know, bugs like that occur uh, on a pretty regular basis. And it's not that out of the ordinary at all. And so what, what and the big, so I, I still want to look on the bright side of this, right? The old racket was war. And I've been yeah. saying this for years now that over history, the scale the scope, the viciousness of the war racket as a global government phenomena has been coming down. Wars are always based on lies. In the globally connected world we live in, it's a lot harder to lie and get away with it. Hmm. So you see World War II, Vietnam, Gulf War, global war on terror. They can't lie to people enough to get you know, big groups of young men to meet in the middle of a field where none of them live and kill each other because they're wearing different colors. That mm. racket doesn't exist in the age of the internet. There are proxy wars, there are skirmishes, there are occupations, there's the, the, the global war of terror, all of these things. But really, the war racket is not what it used to be. And by the way, one of the big stories we covered with the coronaphobia crisis here in America is that of all the bailout money, guess where the biggest chunk of it went? I shouldn't say the biggest chunk, because I don't know the total scale now, but 660 something billion dollars uh, was, a, no, it was, that was a different number, but it was, it was like hundreds of billions to go to compensate military defense contractors as a uniquely economically privileged special group. Well, mm. we, we can't let our defenses down in this time, we have to send even more money to the military industrial complex. I mean, they're all on government contracts anyway. It's not like they're losing employment because of the, I mean, it's, it's just, it's, so even this, what it's designed to keep the people who make the weapons happy mm-hmm. and everybody who's in that, you know, super class. Uh, and what they, they could do next is, you know, what if they, what if they're, what if they made up a new virus crisis, mm-hmm. you know, what? Oh, now there's a new one. It's deadlier and we can't tell you about it because look at how much we got away with in secrecy. You know, we have to censor anybody talking about this on the Internet because if, if you're, you know, and like on YouTube even now, if you put co- Corona or, cro- or COVID-19, that's a sensitive topic. And if you're not mainstream media, you're either going to be demonetized or just not allowed to talk about stuff like that on YouTube. It really is, uh, you know, there's just like with the economy. You know, there's a divergence uh, as the dollar weakens uh, and fiat currencies weaken around the world and people are seeing how much it costs or how impossible it is to work on a job with a registered business that pays taxes and you get a W-2 tax form here in the U.S. when you could work under the table instead. Mm. Yeah. And but- there's, a, there's, a, there's a huge push to that black market and, and split economy right now. 
Well, it, it probably were going to hit a hard recession anyway, and the COVID is just bailing out the companies ahead of time, you know. Um, so your recent run for the Libertarian Party, I mean, well, you, I think you were probably one of the most high profile candidates, at least maybe you, that's my perspective. I don't know if that's everybody else. You, you yeah, and Ver, it, you and Ver, Vermin and Supreme, um, and you got the backing of John McAfee, and you know you raised more than anybody else. Were, were you a tad disappointed that your name is not on the ballot? And how do you feel about the whole process? Well, let me put it. I, I mean, I'm I'm extremely happy with this campaign. Our first goal was to make sure that every delegate slot in the country was competitive because last year or last cycle in 16 when Johnson won, it was only about 60% that were really competitive. And that's how he was able to win by filling those empty seats. And that's why I started running freakishly early with this campaign. And I put in a lot of time. I put, put in a lot of my own money, basically all my own money. And uh, I, I, the campaign was about half my funds and, and half, you know, raised from, you know, traditional or, you know, individuals. But um, if the result of my campaign is that we get someone like Joe Jorgensen as the nominee instead of someone like Gary Johnson or Bob Barr or even Justin Amash or Bill Weld, you know, these people who are in some ways very fairly painted as washed up Republicans. And we fixed that for the Libertarian Party. And I wanted, I genuinely personally say, you know, I'm not big on, I don't brag. I hope that's clear. You know, I don't, I don't try to, you know, take an unrealistically self-promoting view of myself, but I really do want to take some credit personally uh, and give my team a lot of credit for everything that they did to motivate and inspire and organize people to be involved with the Libertarian Party and the nominating process for 2020. I was a little disappointed in the process. I will say the way it was conducted online seemed manipulated. Um, and I ended up coming in sixth. And the way it works with uh, elimination and being everybody's second choice is generally stronger. Uh, we did think that I had a shot to win it right up to the end. Uh, if I could have edged, if I could have come in fifth instead of sixth and just edged out one other candidate, might have made a big difference. But realistically, best case scenario, I probably would have come in third. You know, and I, I you know, I can't say I was robbed of the nomination. You know, a big part of my campaign was making libertarianism about localization when it comes to policy. It is the ultimate manifestation of our ethical principles and policy. It is the ultimate radical platform in getting to the heart of the matter of centralized coercive governments denying people the right to opt out of their systems. It is moderate in that it allows people to be able to maintain whatever system they want at the state, then county, and then local, and ultimately community level. It's the most practical platform in terms of policy and easing our way out of this state, status paradigm and in bringing people into the Libertarian Party because you don't have to agree with us on everything. Oh, we don't agree with us on everything either. Mm -hmm. You just have to say, I want to get what I want voluntarily. When you join the Libertarian Party, you check a box that says, I oppose the initiation of force to achieve political or social goals. That is a beautiful pledge form of the libertarian principles of the non-aggression principle, self-ownership, voluntarism. Yeah, but I just one thing that, like, I mean, that's the beauty of libertarianism that, as you said, it's all about uh, volunteering and the local level. And um, you can have, like, different political uh, opinions on maybe the wider issues, you know, um, but it's it is all got to do with being a, a you know, a lo for me it's local. Everything has to be local. Local politics break it down as small as possible, you know, because um, I, I I have to be honest, I probably would have different opinions on on maybe Trump 
and other things like that. Or, but I, my point is that we can disagree. That's the beauty of the Libertarian Party. <laughs> I, I, yeah, so I, I can't complain too much uh, about the outcome of the primary because we fundamentally failed to either convince a majority of the delegates who were previously already involved with the Libertarian Party that this is the best strategy or bring in enough people. And we were resisted. Of course, there are other candidates who, you know, weren't just in, in good faith engaging in this, but, you know, man, you know, had people on their teams you know, manipulating the process and, 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 you know, nothing, nothing scandalous, just, you know, you know little stuff that happens in, in politics and, and organizing delegates for a national party. And, uh, you know, I'm sorry, but I'm going to keep plugging away here. I'm not going anywhere. And I, I'm, I'm going to be, you know, I, I made the commitment to my supporters that as long as the federal government continues to exist and there is support for me representing this message with this platform of localization as a presidential candidate, I'll keep running, at least until the federal government ceases to exist as we know it. And so I, the, the idea of, of localization is a really critical to advancing humanity. Decentralization, obviously, like blockchain, Bitcoin. You know, we don't need central authorities for money. We don't need governments for anything like that. And just to be clear, this is not to say that when political subdivisions are broken down to the local level, that you can't have international trade and huge mechanisms of international cooperation through big businesses and manufacturing and uh, all of the things that make it possible for us to do this internet uh, inter based interview and in, in our media productions. And, you know, it, it's um, more about how do we make the world a, a more ethical place? Because ethics are good. Being ethical is better than being unethical. Everybody's going to be a lot happier in an ethical world. So one of the ways that I manifest this with my activism is how I live. And four years ago, after living on the road for a, a few years in a 19 foot travel trailer with uh, a dog and a girlfriend, uh, I bought this uh, 10 acres in the mountains of Arizona. And, you know, people think, oh, cacti, there's, there's no cactus up here. It's, uh, no, no, no. We got, well, you'll see. You're about to see the trees. And, you know, this is, you know, again, part of the message in the book, Freedom, uh, especially in the section Work Freedom, where, you know, you consider how am I engaging with the people around me in trading my labor for the goods and services that I want to get back from it? Am I, is it worth, you know, the, the externality uh, costs, the other downsides of joining the military or working for the government or being a contractor or having a job where you pay a lot in taxes as opposed to one where you can work under the table and not contribute with you know, material support to you know, the, the violence and, and evil of government. So really, aside from, you know, libertarianism could be said to be a way of raising your global consciousness because when you realize and, and, and i'm i get it i'm a thin libertarian for people who want to geek out on those terms you know libertarianism just means this but there are huge implications to that core idea of ethics and it's a call to greater conscientiousness to questioning everything and to living a more conscientious life which means redesigning your life from the ground up when you realize that you need to do this. Where do you live? What kind of building do you live in? Where do you get your food, your water, your electricity, uh, money, data, information, energy, like all of these things. Are you contributing to systems that are making the world a worse place just by your consumer choices? Conscientious consumerism is a critical part of advancing libertarianism. So without further ado, <laughs> we're going to step outside here. Looking good. And <laughs> I'm going to show yeah, you can see now I am on the No Force One Studios. This is my bus, my 
campaign bus, also my home. Let's see here. Before we go out, uh, let me, I'm going to turn the key and turn the brightness on my screen all the way up so I can see what I'm looking at out here. And, uh, Rob, you might want to turn off your video because it records. Okay. Let me just... Uh, 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 oh, okay. Yeah, my name in big letters. And here's some of my survivor trees. You can see they knocked, got knocked over and just kept growing. And, you know, for, for Arizona, like it's, it's a little bare here because this is where we've been working and, and pulling weeds and, and driving and stuff. Got my tire collection over there. This is a 28 foot geodesk dome that's going to be uh, our, our, my dream one bedroom house. There's, Comment Jim Freedom, Adam mm -hmm. versus the Man co-host, and okay. uh, COO of Big Igloo Geodesics. We make all these domes right here, actually, in our shipping container workshop. Uh, you can see some of the fun stuff we've built back there. And this is uh, the camp kitchen. And this is, I, I'm just going to show off real quick here. This is my favorite of all my survivor trees. And, and you can see what happened here. It, uh, you know, got knocked over and just decided to keep growing. Okay. And it really is a, a beautiful example of, you know, life finds a way. And when I got out here, uh, it was all a big nasty bush and trimmed it up. And it ended up looking like this, uh, this really beautiful thing where, you know, I cut the end off where it was dying, you know, because it was just push into the dirt there you can see what happened right it, it fell over and the branches on the upside just kept growing into trunks mm -hmm. and now you can see if you look underneath it you can see uh clear under because mm -hmm. it's actually suspended the roots to support this whole tree cantilevered and it is still growing and thriving and there is our uh, our dome of the dank we just uh, put this greenhouse together. We're going to be growing some legal cannabis in there with my uh, my personal Arizona license. I pay the state of Arizona $250 a year, or at least cannabis. And uh, so there's the quick. Excellent. Um, so, Adam, we've covered an awful lot today, and I just want to thank you again for your valuable time, your thoughts, and special insight. And I, I did learn a lot, uh, so thank you for that. It was fantastic. Um, I, I was just going to just, uh, is there anything, apart from what you're doing in your own um, area there in Arizona, is there anything else you've planned in the next few weeks or months? We're going to be uh, declaring our intention to formally declare our independence on Independence Day this year, to declare it on Independence Day next year. Okay. And we are creating something called the United Nations of Freedom. It's like the United Nations, except we care about freedom. Okay. And we are going to be looking for countries to join that it, it, that uh, respect the non-aggression principle. Excellent. And so I am going to be seceding here from the United <laughs> States to create a propertarian constitutional monarchy where you will have to refer to me as King Kokesh the first um, <laughs> or, or his majesty, whichever, which, you know, whatever, whatever feels right for you. Hi, uh, King. Uh, I think, I think my formal title was his majesty, Adam Charles Kokesh the first of Gardenia or settler of Gardenia and first president of the United Nations of Freedom. And so this is with the United Nations of Freedom, the first project is going to be the micro nations project. And that's inspiring. We're going to look around the world as the United Nations of Freedom and be like, oh, crap. Yeah. Nobody qualifies. There's not a government on earth today. That, now, now, there might be some tiny exceptions. I, I'd have to, like, look into evaluating the Vatican, perhaps, and, and, you know, maybe a handful of other tiny ones like that. But generally speaking, there isn't a government on earth today 
that explicitly respects freedom as an ethical principle or has a consistent moral framework up to the standards of, of what the non-aggression principle does in, in terms of its completeness. So this is uh, the, 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 the formal title of our uh, kingdom here is the, uh, the no, uh, see, I had it written out. I can't even remember it. It's so long. <laughs> we may have made it as long as possible. You know, this is, this is a very serious project in terms of asserting our sovereignty and, and asking for it and finding out just how much of it will be respected. And that's part of what we're doing. This is why I'm taking a year to do this so that we can negotiate uh, border terms with, uh, with, with our neighboring country, the United States. We can talk to local law enforcement. We can, you know, co you know, connect with the community here in a way that, you know, set, makes the terms clear, uh, you know, send a letter to the State Department, things like that. And the allodial sovereign bountiful kingdom of the Garden of Freedom in perpetuity will be a sovereign kingdom as of Independence Day next year, if we do everything right and have your support in this, and there are people who similarly want to assert their rights through secession and sovereignty by private property or legitimate ethical homesteading. So that being said, Rob, I've got that. You know, I've got uh, my my war memoir, Hot, Dirty, and Dangerous, that has been in the works for a long time. Like, actually, it's been in the works since I got back from Iraq. It was my college thesis in 2005 and uh, so releasing that book releasing uh, another book american freedom is the the american localization you know presidential platform manifesto and doing book tours for both of those building adam versus the man is independent media and you know getting ready for 2024 uh with adam versus the man it's really exciting you know what we're able to do now it seems like there was a golden age of independent media on the internet before facebook censorship really kicked in yeah. and google bought youtube and yes. screwed everybody over there and there are it seems like now you know we we've been we've been in kind of a lull after that like early golden age and i think we're coming to another one that's what yeah. it feels like for me getting back into adam versus the man so if anybody wants to join me for that, thefreedomline.com, you can find all of our stuff there, all three words, thefreedomline.com. You can get my book there for free. You can plug into the show, see the content, all my social media stuff. And Rob, I'll just finish with this last thought for okay. what you're doing as a way of uh, expressing my appreciation and uh, you know, asking for help from your audience in a way that a lot of us are afraid to ask for directly ourselves. So I'll just say that this technology that we have today, the internet, communications, everything else, recording, broadcasting, it's amazing. And I'm a huge tech optimist. This is yeah. critical to human progress, but it means nothing without deliberate, conscientious use. And that's what independent media is. And it's not possible without an active, and engaged audience. So for those of you who have made it all the way to the end of this interview, put your money where your mouth is, as in put your money where your eyes and ears are, whether it's this show or another one, if you can't sponsor, pay, Patreon, whatever support it is that your, uh, your favorite hosts are asking for, at least share content that you think is important. And together we can overcome the biases and exploitation rackets made possible by the mainstream media. So for everybody who's made this show possible, for everybody who's made my show and my activism possible, thank you very much. And Rob, thank you for the opportunity to connect with your audience today. That's fantastic, Adam. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, uh, thanks for the tour of your air, uh, compound as well. Um, uh, so uh, thanks, Adam. Um, hold, on, hold, on, hold on, just because I'm a libertarian doesn't mean it's a compound. I know. I, I, I prefer, I, I prefer I, homestead. There's much more peaceful, righteous connotations than compound. I actually said that on purpose. Uh -huh. I, I knew you'd react. <laughs> um, so t thanks, Adam. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Peace and love, y'all. Choose happiness and be excellent to each other. Thanks, Rob.